Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CWNP podcast. This is podcast number one. And today we're going to be talking about a very important topic, and that is systems thinking for wireless administrators and engineers. Now, we'll be going through the concept of systems thinking first to make sure we understand what this concept is. And then I'm just going to casually talk to you about some of the reasons why it can be so important as wireless technology professionals, whether we're an administrator, a security engineer, a design engineer, if we're troubleshooting a problem, whatever we're dealing with and related to wireless, it's best to think of that target system as exactly that, a system. And so as we go through this process, we're going to be looking at these various systems that are utilized within the wireless world. This includes both Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi wireless protocols. And as we go through this process, we're going to hopefully begin to comprehend this concept of thinking about all of these technologies as systems, rather than just thinking of them as an object or a thing. Because when you grasp the concept of a system and you begin to apply that to your analysis, you end up with better design results, more secure solutions, you're able to troubleshoot more quickly, and of great importance, you're able to actually meet the needs of users and organizations. So systems thinking ends up having a huge impact on the results that we get when we're deploying and supporting wireless solutions. Now, one of the key things to keep in mind when we're thinking about systems is just the general benefit of the conceptualization of a system. You know, when you look, for example, at the practice of medicine, People don't look at, or at least the best doctors don't look at us as just somebody who right now has a cold or somebody who right now has a fever, but rather they ask, okay, looking at the whole system of this individual, their circular system, their their breathing capabilities, how do they breathe? How do they digest food? How do they think? All of these various systems that we have, our nervous systems, our digestive systems, our circulatory systems, they all integrate, don't they? They work together to form this thing we call a human body. And if we look at them individually and don't think about how changing one system will impact other systems, we can actually reduce someone's health rather than improve their health. It's exactly the same with our technology systems, whether they're hard systems and we're just thinking about the technical systems or soft systems and we're thinking about the human side of these technologies. When we think about how they integrate, we get much better results. So as we go through this process, we're going to be looking at the concept of systems thinking beginning with an understanding of just what systems thinking is or what systems thinking does. So one good way to think about this is to realize that systems thinking actually views systems as cohesive, interconnected wholes, rather than a collection of parts. So in other words, we're not just asking what do all the parts do, but we're asking how do they relate to each other? What are their interactions? And when these parts are brought together, how do they function as a whole? You know, one of the things I like to talk about when I'm talking about systems is the system of an automobile. Uh, An individual who inspired a lot of my thinking about systems was Russell Acoff. And one of, he uses this as an example a lot. He says, if you have people bring the best automobiles in the world into a shop, and then you disassemble and analyze all of the different components of those different automobiles, and you decide which one has the best engine, which one has the best transmission, which one has the best uh, differential, the best tires, the best body, the best frame, the best seats, the best steering wheels, all the rest. You break all of these things apart into their parts and ask which one has the best. And you say, all right, now take all those best components and just throw them together for me as a new car. And that will be the best car ever made. Actually, probably not. It will probably be the worst car ever made because we're making the mistake of thinking that that car, that automobile, that system is what it is because it has the best parts, not necessarily. If you look at each part individually, the very best engine against 
the best transmission out of a pool of transmissions may result in that transmission overheating, that transmission breaking down. There could be some problem when that transmission interacts with that engine that means you really can't use them together. And then, of course, there's just the coupling issue that they may not interface properly. There may be no way to connect the transmission to the engine. The point is that putting all the best parts together does not necessarily always create the best whole. But putting the right parts together can create the best whole. And that's absolutely key. So the first thing to keep in mind is that we're looking at a system as the collection of all the parts interconnected and with their interrelations and not just looking at the individual components. So the focus is on those relationships and interactions. Second, systems thinking recognizes that complex system behaviors emerge from the interactions of the parts, not the actions of the parts taken separately. This is absolutely key. And again, the common mistake that is often made is thinking that when we're thinking about our systems, we should be thinking about all those individual parts and what they do. And then once we do that, we understand the system. It's just not the case. Complex system behaviors emerge. This is known as emergence within systems thinking, right? Things emerge that sometimes we didn't predict. So there are unpredictable emergence behaviors when we build a system, um, or at least unpredicted. They may not be unpredictable. We might be able to predict some of them, but there will be those unpredictable things. And, and those things can be negative. There can be negative results that come about by emergence, but there are, can also be what uh, systems thinkers often call serendipitous things. And serendipitous things are actually good things that emerge that we may not have expected. So we deploy a system and we find out, wow, when that system is deployed within the larger system of our organization, there are these benefits that we didn't think of. And that can be a really nice benefit within these environments. So absolutely key is understanding that the broader environment and contexts, rather than just the events and elements in isolation, must be considered when we're performing systems thinking. So this is absolutely key. And then the next thing is that systems thinking seeks to synthesize and understand systems as integrated wholes rather than analyze separate events and components. So in other words, we want to know how all the parts of a system work together, but we also want to know how the systems work together. This is absolutely important. System performance will depend on how well the parts fit and how well they act independently, but more importantly, how they act interdependently. So yes, you want good components, but the independent capabilities are not the most important capabilities. The most important capabilities are the interdependent capabilities. So if you look at an individual piece of software, for example, and you say, wow, this software works great. This is the best software to use because it's working wonderful. But then you think about how your organization functions. Then all of a sudden you might say, oh, but in our organization, that great feature I like is actually a negative. Or in our organization, there's a very important process we use that this software does not consider. And all of a sudden, what's really great software, when you just look at it alone, is not so great when it's pulled into the system that is your organization. So we have to think about the interdependence of the parts and not just the independent capabilities. And then finally, for our summary of, of systems thinking, systems thinking looks at long-term dynamic impacts of decisions rather than just short-term efficiencies or benefits. So the big thing here is to consider this idea that the thinking is circular and it's nonlinear. Instead of thinking at it as linear cause effect change. So we often think of if this happens, then this happens, and then that causes this to happen. But we don't often think of the feedback. So right with systems thinking, we think about feedback loops. So not only when A happens, does B happen, which affects C, but it may be that, F, that, that B also affects A, causing A to change its behavior, which in turn affects B, which affects C, which affects B, which affects C, which affects B, which affects A, right? And so it's not linear. It, it doesn't just move forward 
when we're dealing with system interactions, but rather there's reciprocity. There are these circular events that occur that causes one system to change another system. And let me uh, il illustrate what I mean by this. So when we deploy some kind of a wireless IoT solution in an engineering plant, for example, then after we deploy that solution, people are going to begin to change their behaviors because of this new technology that has come into play. For example, there might be some negative emergent consequences because of that system. Maybe we deploy a system that monitors certain things in the environment. And those things are seen by the OT engineers in that space as related to this larger group of things that they have traditionally monitored manually. And they're assuming that that great new system monitors all the things that they traditionally manager, uh, monitored in that bundle that they think of, right? So they think of all these things going together. There's a thing that I do every day and I monitor six different variables and I make sure that everything's healthy for plant operations. But the new IoT system that we implemented only monitors four of those things and not all six, but they think of them as a bundle. So they assume that when you started monitoring those four things, you're monitoring all six and the negative impact then in that environment is that they stop monitoring the other two. And then we could have machine failure. We could have defects in our manufacturing process. We end up with problems because of a negative emergence. And there's this, again, circular process, right? We implemented a system that did something good. That integrated with the entire um, operational technology system in that environment and the soft side of it as well, these human beings that are actually using the system. And those human beings made decisions related to the system that then impacted our operations in a way that maybe we didn't expect. But it could also impact it in a positive way. So we could have serendipitous emergence, right? So we implement that IoT system. And regardless of whether it monitors four or six of those things in that evaluation bundle, the reality is that we implement that system and then People realize that because of the metrics that we're getting now, maybe on a more frequent basis, we can make different decisions and these different decisions can optimize our production line and we can increase production by 13%. And so we didn't actually expect that. We were monitoring it to make sure that we remove possible human failure that could result in injury or defects or things like that. But in the end, we also resulted in achieving greater production. And so there can be all of these types of emergence that occur simply because of the fact that over the time, there's feedback within the system. One system makes a decision based on how another system impacted it, which can cause that other system to then also make decisions. And the end result is more and more emergence over time of new capabilities and new results. Now, We've talked a little bit about systems thinking, kind of defined it. But what we actually, have, actually haven't done is really defined a system per se. So let's define a system very clearly. A system is a set of two or more elements that we call system elements, wherein the behavior of each element impacts the behavior of the whole and the behavior of the elements and their effects on the whole are interdependent. Now, we've alluded to this as we've been talking about it because we have talked about this interdependence and we've talked about how the system is comprised of different parts that impact one another. And so systems thinking is thinking about the entire collective of all the parts and how they impact one another. And by that, we've almost intuitively uh, defined what a system is, but now we're clearly defining it. Going further, we could say that the system has emergent properties that arise from the interrelationships that are destroyed when the system is disassembled. Now let's go back to our car analogy to understand this statement that they're destroyed when the system is disassembled. Let's say that you have a, oh, I don't know, let's say a 500 horsepower engine in your vehicle. That engine causes with the right transmission differential and all the other moving parts, that engine results in that car being able to go from zero to 60 really quick to be able to go really fast, right? But if we disassemble that system, if we take that 500 horsepower engine out of that car and we put it on a storage location and just place it there, now how fast can that engine go? The answer is zero miles per hour. It can't go zero to 60 at all anymore, no matter how much time we give it. 
the engine simply cannot move. The system as a whole, that car, once you take another system, a controlling system, and you put it in that car, you know, a human being, or it could be self-driving car eventually. But the point is, once we put a controlling system, the human being inside of that system that is the car to control it, that car can go really fast and can go great distances and can go fast. It can go slow depending on the control system. But the moment you take the engine out of the car, you take the same human and have it interact with that engine. And unless they're really strong, they can't really move it at all, right? They'll need some other system now to hook up to that, maybe a pulley system, so that they can lift it. Now the human can move it, but that engine, which is actually a system in and of itself, right? It has pistons and, and camshafts and all, all these different things. So it's got all these different parts. It, it is a system itself, but that system can only generate a spinning movement, power, right? That's really all it can do. It can't generate movement of itself or of anything else. But when you take that engine and you couple it with a transmission, and that's coupled with a differential, and that's coupled with axles and tires, and, and on and on, we eventually build up this car, then assembled together, the system functions in that it provides us mobility with different levels of per performance, depending on the different components that we utilize to build the car. The system as a whole gives us a result. The individual parts of that system destroy that result if we separate them, if we disassemble them. And it's the same with our uh, take an IoT system, right? So you get these sensors out in the field that are gathering temperature data, humidity data, light sensors, motion sensors, all these different sensors out in the plant, for example. They're gathering all this data, but they're disconnected from the rest of the network. They're disconnected from any type of data uh, uh, protocols like MQTT or AMQP or whatever. They're, they're disconnected from business applications that can analyze that data and make decisions. In other words, they're just out there monitoring. They're not really transmitting the data in any way that becomes useful. So we've got something that if we connected with some data protocols, connect it with some data storage locations, connect it with some real-time analysis solutions, connect it with some business applications. Then all of a sudden we start to get value out of the whole IoT system. This is why in the wireless IoT track at CWMP, we focus very heavily on the integration of all of these IoT parts and pieces because one of them alone doesn't really give you a whole lot of value or any at all in some cases. But when you integrate them together, and form what we would call an IoT solution or IoT system, which is not just an IoT device. It's that device integrated with data protocols, integrated with real-time analysis and with cloud-based systems possibly, with business applications and all of the rest. We bring all of that data together and we have something that gives us actual value. So very important to think about these concepts when we're defining what a system is. There are systems and then there are systems of systems and they work together to give us the end result that we desire. Now, we also say that the elements of a system include people, processes, technology, resources, policies, information and more. So all of these can be elements of a system. A system can be an element of a larger system, right? So it may contain subsystems that form a super system or what we call in IT a lot of times system of systems. System boundaries determine which elements are inside and outside the system based on the perspective and purpose of the observer. And boundaries may expand or contract as system understanding evolves. Now, this is very, very important to understand. Anytime we're doing systems thinking, we have to constrain our thinking. We can't just say, I'm going to think about the system as a whole. Well, where do you stop? Let, let's begin with our wireless voice over IP handset. That is a system by itself. But you might say, well, I, I don't want to stop there. I want to think of the whole system. Okay, well, then, then that exists within your entire wireless LAN. And then you might say, okay, but, but I want to think about the whole system. Okay, well, that exists within your entire network. Well, but I want to think about the whole system. Well, your network's connected to the internet, so that exists within the whole internet. 
Well, but, but I want to think about the whole system. Okay, well, the Internet exists on planet Earth, which is a system itself, which does actually impact the Internet, right? We have natural disasters. We've often seen portions of the Internet become unavailable. So, so the Earth impacts it. Well, but I want to think about the whole system. Well, the, the, the Earth exists in the galaxy, uh, but I want to think about the whole system. Well, the galaxy exists within the universe. Well, I want to think about the whole system. Well, the universe, well maybe exists in multiple universes. The point is, how far do you keep expanding? Because once you've expanded out, even if you've just expanded out to the internet, you really want to analyze that whole system in relation to your voice over IP handset? Probably not. And so what you need to do is you need to ask, what level of abstraction do I need to be at to make sure that my voice over IP solution across my Wi-Fi network works well? Right. And that's usually going to be your own network and possibly the performance and service level agreement you have with your ISP, per se, but not the Internet as a whole, really, because you don't have a lot of control over that. So it's going to be at the very least your wireless LAN and maybe your entire network that you think about, depending on exactly how you're deploying those voice over IP handsets. The point is you've got to set a boundary. Because if you try to think about the whole internet and then go down, oh my goodness, you're, you're dealing with all of the internet gateways and routers. You're dealing now with web application servers all over the internet and how the fact that, that, that you just think about your voice over IP, well, wait a minute, hold on, you've got amazon.com that exists out there. So what kind of impact do they have on the overall internet bandwidth that's available to everybody in the world? And then you've got to add in eBay and then you've got to add in Google and then you've got to add in chat GPT. And the point is you keep plugging in all these different systems that are draining ultimately the total bandwidth available, which is impacting your total bandwidth available. And you're just beginning to become what I seem to be acting like right now, a little bit crazy. It's just too much. We have to rein it in. So a very important part of the systems thinker and therefore of the systems engineer and the system designer is to set a boundary. What is my, what we call within most of the ISO, IEC, IEEE standards, what is my system of interest? What's the thing I really want to focus on? That's where I'm setting my boundary to make sure I am focusing on the thing that is most important to me. And that's absolutely essential. So we've defined our system, but we also need to realize that there are various systems thinking perspectives, ways to think about systems thinking. One of the best summaries of this actually was in a paper in 2008 called Applying Systems Thinking and Aligning It to Systems engineering by INCOS. If you're not familiar with INCOS or INCOSI, as some say, um, it, it's an organization that is all focused on systems engineering. They have a lot of great papers and, and books and articles and information at their website. So do a search for them, I-N-C-O-S-E, and you'll get some really good information out of that organization. But the, the focus of this paper was on, you know, how do we align systems thinking with our systems engineering? And they gave nine different systems thinkings perspective that they focused on. So these nine thinkings are, first of all, operational thinking. And operational thinking is what you might think of as black box thinking. So when, when we're dealing with security penetration testing and things like that, for example, right, we often think about black box testing. And that means we can't see inside the box. We don't know what's going on in there. And then we talk about white box testing. We're saying the whole box is open to us. We know everything about it. Well, an operational perspective in systems thinking is about focusing on not what goes on inside the system, but when I have an input into it, I get an input out of it. I don't care what happens inside. Some people define this as the user's perspective of the system, right? So if a user for example, uses uh, Photoshop. I don't know if you've noticed, but the new versions of Photoshop that have come out recently have AI capabilities built into them, right? So they have the ability to uh, generate new information. So for example, you can take a photo that you have and then you can crop it out instead of in and then just tell Photoshop to do AI generative fill. And it will do that. Well, all the user wants is a really great result when they do that. They don't care what type of neural networks and uh, under uh, under the hood algorithms are being processed. And they just want to know, I do this, I get that. 
But now you can think of that AI generative capability as one of the things that this system, our graphics uh, editing system called Photoshop can do, right? So it can do many different things. And so the user indeed does want to know that the system can do what it needs to do, but they don't care about how it does it. That would be that operational viewpoint. And you could think of it sort of as a high level viewpoint, but not necessarily the highest level, which we'll talk about later. But when you're looking at a specific system, um, you say, you know, take an IoT device, for example, as a system, what do I need? Well, I need a CPU that can work at a particular speed to do the processing I need. I need a certain amount of memory to store the data. Uh, I need a, a sensor interface so I can connect different sensors to read environmental information about the environment. I need a wireless radio to talk to a specific type of wireless gateway. So maybe that's uh, 802.15.4, it's LoRa, whatever it is. So I need all those parts and pieces. And all I care about when I am at this operational level of that system is being able to say to an engineer, this thing needs to be able to monitor temperature and light with this level of granularity of sensor data, and it needs to be able to communicate it across a LoRa network. I want to make sure that it is secure. It needs to be able to do this every second. Right. So I'm, I'm dealing with well, every second would be a lot for a LoRa network. But so let's say once an hour. So I'm dealing with operational, what it needs to do. I actually don't care what CPU they use. I don't care what uh, 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 sensor interface that they have on their system or if the, sens the sensors are just built right into the system board. You know, I just I don't care as long as it gives, gives me what I need. The operational view defines the needs that that system, that IoT and device needs to do. The functional view, the next view in our list is actually the one that says, now we're going inside out. And so the functional view does decide, well, based on how often they want it to report and the process intensity of talking to the sensor, so forth, what CPU do I need? How much memory do I need? Those details we started with. That's what the functional view looks at. It makes sure that the right parts are there in order to get the result that I need. Think of the automobile we talked about as an example of a system. When we're dealing with that, you might say, well, my most important priority is to get 70 miles per gallon. Well, then you're probably going to need a hybrid vehicle that you run on electric most of the time or something like that to get 70 miles a gallon. Or, hey, you could drive a motorcycle. But the point is that based on your priority, you're certainly, if your your highest priority is to get a, a very good MPG, you're not going to go out and buy a muscle car. You're not going to go buy a sports car that can do zero to 60 in, you know, four seconds, right? You're just not going to do that uh, because that kind of vehicle is generally going to have much lower miles per gallon. So from an operational perspective, you're not so much thinking as the user about what exactly is the engine in that car? What exactly is the transmission? You're saying, I want it to be fast or I don't. I want it to have high mileage or I'm okay with lower mileage. I want it to uh, uh, have good uh, towing power or I'll never tow anything, right? So you're thinking about operational things you need to be able to do. But when the person is doing inside out to give you a pickup truck that has towing power, as opposed to an automobile that has high gas mileage, they have to look at that functional perspective. They have to go deeper into the parts of that system. Now, the next one that you have in our list here is the big picture perspective. And basically the big picture perspective looks at a system in the context of the system it is in, but it doesn't always stop with only those systems immediately connected to it. It may ask, all right, my system, we'll call it SOI, right? The system of interest. My system is SOI and it's connected to systems A, B, and C. But system A is connected to systems D, E, and F. And system B is connected to systems one, two, and three. So the big picture branches out and says, I want to look at those other systems too. Taking it back into the context of the IoT we were talking about, right? We might say, well, I've got my IoT device. That's a system in and of itself. An IoT device is a system. You know, I happen to have on my desk right here a, 
a wireless adapter. Well, this wireless adapter is a system in and of itself. Uh, it, ha it has a radio in it. It has a USB interface. It has a radio chain connected to these antennas, a couple of radio chains. This is a system. But I'm going to use this USB cable and I'm going to attach it to another system, right? That's the way we use devices that are themselves systems. We often integrate them with other systems. So the question then is, if I connect that USB adapter to a very slow computer system, so my system of interest is the USB adapter. When I connect it to a very slow computer system, it may, if I'm trying to capture Wi-Fi wi frames, for example, it may not do as well at capturing the frames had I connect, as it would had I connected it to a much more powerful system, right? So all of a sudden, as I'm thinking big picture, I'm growing out. And, and then what about the other system? On my computer system is a software system that is the protocol analysis software. And there's a big difference between just capturing with T-Shark and capturing with Wireshark or capturing with a dedicated Wi-Fi analyzer package that knows how to not only decode the Wi-Fi frames, but also give me expert analysis of them. I'm going to get very different results depending on that exact same system. That was an alpha USB adapter. That exact same system, when it's connected to one computer versus another, I'll get different performance. When I'm using one software package versus another on that computer, I'll get different capabilities. And so I cannot always just think of my system as it exists alone, my Wi-Fi USB adapter. But instead, I have to branch out to the big picture and say there are systems that my system is connected to, which are connected to other systems. And when I begin to look at that, I begin to see different pictures of the things I need to consider to make sure my system works effectively. The next one that we have is the structural system. Here we're thinking about the architecture, the structural perspective, I should say. Here we're thinking about the architecture of the system. So when we're thinking about the architecture of the system, what we're thinking about is what all the parts and pieces are that must exist for that system to function as a whole. The architecture and the internal subsystem partition boundaries and any effects on the system because of its internal structure. So this goes back to some of the things that we talked about about the functional perspective, right? Too little memory in a device impacts that's, that device's ability to function as a system. When we begin to think about our device connected to our computer, if we want to think of our wireless analysis system as a whole, right? We've got our Wi-Fi adapter, we've got our computer, we've got our protocol analysis software. Now, when we think of that as a whole, we have to realize that together as a whole, this architecture, this structure that I put in place, those three pieces, the software, the computer, and the Wi-Fi adapter, um, they, from a structural perspective, give me the ability to do protocol analysis. But how good my protocol analysis experience and benefit is, is going to depend on decisions I've made, remember, about those internal subsystem capabilities. So within the protocol analysis software, what features and capabilities does it have that are now part of my overall structure of this protocol analysis system that I have developed, right? So it all comes together. Then we also have the generic perspective. This looks for similarities between the system and other systems uh, that might be in the same domain or might be in other domains. And it can lead to um, the inheritance of domain requirements from similar systems, the adoption of lessons learned from those other environments and so forth. The whole point is when we take the generic perspective, and why is it called generic? Because it's not domain specific, okay? So let's talk about this for a second. It's easy to get trapped within just your own domain expertise. And, and, and that causes you to be what sometimes the literature calls an I person. Uh, and, and it's not that you're thinking about yourself, but that you have one vertical knowledge of expertise. Whereas what in the literature they call a T individual or a T person type, is one that they definitely have their area of domain expertise, but they have really good professional level, maybe even expert level knowledge in some other domains. And you find that those individuals tend to be the ones that are the best at problem solving, coming up with good solutions, all of those kinds of things, because they're not narrowly focused. They are looking at other domains 
and they're learning from those other domains. So the generic perspective says, I want to try to look at my system. I want to see my system, not just as a Wi-Fi engineer, not just as an IoT engineer. I want to see my system as a business manager. I want to see my system as the end user sees it. I, I, I want to see my system as a manufacturing engineer sees it. So I want to get outside of my domain specific blinders and try to see this system from that other perspective. That, that's why it's called a generic perspective, right? We're getting outside of our domain specificity. And then you have the continuum perspective, which says that we look at things not so much as either or, do it or don't do it, but as states in between, right? There's a continuum. Um, so if someone says, can you do this within your wireless system you're deploying? Rather than just saying no, because maybe you can't do the thing that they're asking for within the constraints that have been imposed. You think about what can I get for them that is closer to what they want than what we're already planning will be. Maybe I can't get to X, but can I get to Y? Can I get to W? Can I get to something else that might help to meet some of the needs? And one key thing, obviously, there is to ask the stakeholder, hey, why do you need that thing? So, so oftentimes that's a question that we fail to ask so much of the time. We fail to ask, why do you need this? And because we don't ask why they need it, we don't realize we've got a perfect solution that meets their why problem. It just happens to not be the specific thing they asked for, but I can still address their why in another way, even though I can't do the thing that they asked for. So this continuum perspective causes us to look at that system and the decisions we're making in relation to it, not as yes or no, but as what else? What are the other options that I could use to fulfill that particular need? And then the next one that we have is the temporal perspective. And this says that we're looking at our system in the scale of time. So we're thinking about how that system exists today, sure, but how's time going to impact that system? This causes us to think about things like availability, maintenance, um, removal of the system, or technically we sometimes say it's obsolescence, right? It causes us to think long term. One of the things that we think a lot about with Wi-Fi is how long is it going to be before we can just use WPA3 and not use WPA2 anymore? How long is it going to be before we can say that more than 50% of people have support for OWE instead of still having to use open systems authentication? How long is it going to be? And, you know, we have a lot of those questions, right? We think a lot about those things. And what that is doing is we're looking at the system from a temporal perspective. And why do we do that? Why would we be thinking about how long is it going to be until? Because we want to be ready for it. We want to be ready to implement, use, benefit from those technologies when we can. So we're continually watching our system as it exists in today's context, rather than just looking at our system as it existed at the time of implementation. And then we're just kind of making sure it keeps working as it always worked. We're continually asking over time. Now, what needs to change? Now, what needs to improve? So that's one perspective of this temporal perspective. We're looking at how things change over time. We're also thinking into the future so that we can prevent problems, right? Because we're looking at, okay, if this system is functioning like this today and it's interacting with these other systems, and I know that they're getting ready to enhance or upgrade those other systems, I realize my system is not going to be able to keep up with the capacity anymore. And so I have got to be planning my upgrade of the wireless system, the Wi-Fi system, the IoT wireless system, so that I can handle these changes that are coming. That would be that temporal perspective, looking outside of the now. And then we have the quantitative perspective. The quantitative perspective relates to the big picture perspective um, and operational and functional perspectives, but we're looking at those things to come up with performance level requirements. So we wanna have a way to measure our system's performance. You know, that's why we have, although it's it's an odd term for us today, because most of us don't think about putting two horses on a cart instead of one horse on a cart to get more 
horsepower. Uh, but the term horsepower for our engines is the quantitative measurement we use. You know, it's like having 500 horses in the engine. That That's a pretty big engine compartment to fit all them in there, isn't it? But anyway, the point is quantitative perspective is about metrics. It's about being able to measure. And then finally, we have the scientific perspective. So the scientific perspective is about covering the formulation and testing of hypothetical representations or models of the system to meet the need. In other words, scientific perspectives says maybe we're going to use some modeling processes and allow those modeling processes to actually help us determine what the best final system will be. So we can actually use modeling software that's available out there and other such tools to evaluate. I want you to think about this. We actually do this. We just don't realize that we're using scientific systems thinking. Every time you use a wireless LAN design program that models the propagation of RF in an environment, and you've carefully drawn in your walls and, and you've built all the material uh, specifications out appropriately, and you've put in an AP with the right output power and antenna connected. Every time you've gone through that process, you've been doing scientific systems thinking. You just didn't realize it. And then what do you do? You change the model a little bit, right? Change the output power on the AP, go with a different model AP, disable certain 2.4 gigahertz radios, um, all of these things. When you're tweaking the little things, you're changing the model and you're seeing different results. So this is where this scientific systems thinking plugs right into what we've already been doing. Now you just kind of have a name for it. Now, I do want to be clear. I'm not saying that there's no overlap at all between these models and neither were the authors of the paper that uh, I got this list from. Um, but instead, we're saying that these are distinct perspectives you can take. And what I'm going to say is you shouldn't take any of these distinct perspectives with your system. But you should use these different perspectives to do a better job of thinking about the system in order to come up with the best ultimate optimization, upgrade, enhancement, or first deployment of the system that you're building. It gives you greater results in the end. Now, we have another thing to think about before I just kind of talk to you about all of this, and that is hard versus soft systems. So in hard versus soft systems, hard systems are structured. They focus on technical issues. They're quantitative in nature, objective views of that system, whereas soft systems are unstructured. They're often human issues, qualitative in nature, and maybe subjective, more on that continuum perspective that we talked about, right? But guess what? The systems that we use as information systems professionals, they are both. They're a combination of hard and soft systems. Some of them may be more soft than hard, and some of them may be more hard than soft, but they're a combination of these systems. You can't deploy a Wi-Fi solution without understanding what the users need. And you can't understand how to meet the user's needs if you don't understand Wi-Fi systems. There's interdependence here. The point is uh, very simply that we have to look at our system from both the hard and soft perspectives, we have to think about going back to that example I gave of an IoT solution that monitors these only four out of six metrics that the OT people were doing in a bundle before the end result, because we didn't use soft thinking for soft systems methodology. It's called within the industry because we didn't use soft systems thinking or soft systems methodologies. We didn't consider those OT people. We didn't interact with them. We didn't have discussions with them. And because we didn't, we didn't get information from them about the question that likely would have come up. What about these other two metrics? Oh, maybe our IoT solution needs to deal with that. Or we just need to communicate that we're not dealing with that. That's not part of the boundary. Remember, we always have to have a boundary for our system. That's not part of the boundary for this system. And so you'll have to continue doing those two things. But this will take care of these four for you and you'll have access to the dashboard and the reports to analyze the results. So because we keep in mind that we're involved in a systems thinking kind of scenario where we have to deal with both hard and soft systems, 
then we end up involving those humans, those users more, and we get better end results. That's the big key. All right. So what I want to do is kind of summarize the podcast today by talking about wireless and systems thinking. So we've been talking a lot just about systems thinking. We've defined systems thinking. We've defined systems. But what we haven't done completely is said specifically and directly why it's so important. Why is systems thinking so important? And the answer is that without systems thinking, I'm just going to state this very directly, without systems thinking, you will not generate good and effective system requirements. You just won't do it. You're going to miss so many things. Without using these different perspectives, I've covered nine. Um, we could cover 20 or 30 system perspectives. When you look over the systems uh, science literature over the last mostly three decades, started in the 60s, but really boomed in, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, thanks to people like Peter Senge uh, from the business and, and operations perspective of business operations and uh, Russell Acoff from the OT world. He was one of the world's leading authorities on operations technology. And then he transitioned over to really focusing on systems for the rest of his life. He passed away in the first decade of this century, but right up to the end was still lecturing and giving great insight into systems theory. So from the thinking of all of these people, what we've come to realize is the essentiality of systems thinking when doing requirements engineering. And this is one of the reasons why when you look at the standards for requirements engineering that we focus on in the wireless IoT track, as well as in CWDP now, that we look at um, ISO IEC IEEE 2914-8-2018. That's, that's the standard, right? We look at that standard because it's such an excellent but not overwhelming specification for how to do requirements analysis and engineering. And there's a significant portion of that that's dealing with systems of systems the system of interest, basically systems thinking. That's where it starts. The first thing you have to do is define the boundary of your system. You cannot define requirements without a boundary because you got to focus on something to do, right? I can't, for example, if somebody says, man, we need, we need more highways in the United States, which I can't imagine that, but, but let's say that somebody says, we need more highways in the United States then I can't just take my system that I'm going to focus on as the whole highway system in the United States and then think I'm going to get a new highway somewhere. Instead, I got to pick a highway. And now I can focus on that highway. But even when I pick that highway, let's say it's an inter interstate highway and I'm going to build it across multiple states. Even when I pick that highway, I now have to break it down to states and maybe to certain areas within states and focus on each one of those as kind of a micro project. And I've got to look at when I put in this highway, what system is it going to exist within? What are the cities around it? What, uh, what is the environment, the geography? Are there rivers I need to cross? Are there mountains I need to climb? All of these are things that I have to ask when I'm doing that. So I need to set a boundary and then focus on that area. I can manage that. I can get some requirements for that. I can plan the budget for that. I can hire the crews for that. I can make it happen. But if it's a highway that goes all the way across the United States, I'm not saying we don't think about it there, but I'm saying we've got to break that into some subunits that can now effectively be managed. This is the whole concept of project portfolio management within organizations. Instead of looking at everything as a project, one project, we look at a portfolio of different projects that help us achieve some end result or end results. And it's the same thing here. So we've got to have boundaries within our system and focus on that so that we can establish requirements. So if we have to have boundaries within our system, there must be a system. Therefore, I need to think about it as a system. And I, I want to leave you with this. Uh, one of the things that we do when we're thinking about systems is we we're thinking holistically and we're not so much thinking with a reductionist viewpoint. 
So when you're thinking reductionist, again, back to the automobile, you're breaking it into its parts, the car parts, and you're looking at each part. And what does that part do? But notice that, I don't know if you've ever done any work on a vehicle. I, I've done quite a, lit when I, a lot when I was a teenager. I actually helped my dad overhaul engines, and I've never overhauled an engine as an adult, never really enjoyed that work. But I have changed starters and alternators, um, changed my own oil, changed my own brakes, changed rotors and calipers. I've dropped a transmission in my adult life. That's quite a few years ago and replaced some parts and put it back up again. I've changed clutches. Uh, I've done a lot of that kind of work on automobiles. But the key thing is, you know what I always needed when I did that work? I needed wrenches and ratchets. And sadly, I didn't have enough money early on in my adult life to have power tools. So I was dealing with it the manual way. And I needed those tools, right? Why? Because I had to take things apart because they were connected to each other. Did you know that starter didn't exist by itself? It was connected to the engine. Otherwise, if the starter wasn't connected to the engine and I turned the key, but it was connected to the battery, I would just hear this and nothing would happen to my engine because the starter has to be connected. So the whole point of systems thinking is don't think about a starter alone. Think about how it interacts with the engine. I need a different starter to turn over a 500 horsepower engine than I do a little four cylinder engine. It's that simple. It has to be a different starter. So I got to think about the whole system so I can get the right starter. If I'm just focused in on the starter, I miss that. So systems thinking doesn't ignore the parts. It considers the parts holistically. Whereas reductionist thinking breaks it all apart into its parts and then just focuses on each individual, but doesn't consider the interdependencies. Now, I've been thinking an awful lot about this over the last few years. And I will tell you very clearly when it started. It started being a very heavy part of my thinking around 2015 when I really began to study the Internet of Things in great depth. Because you cannot, you simply cannot provide a good IoT solution without systems thinking. And then it kind of came full circle. And I realized that maybe we didn't know it, but we developed best practices over the years in the Wi-Fi engineering space that are actually derived out of systems thinking and we just weren't necessarily told that. And when you understand that they're derived out of systems thinking, you might understand when the best practice are in, practices are indeed just that. They're best practices. They're not best for your situation. Yours might differ because you're in a different situation. And so you change the practice to the right practice, which is the best practice for your situation. You know, it goes back to the old debates about one AP per classroom and some of those early things in Wi-Fi that we heard. And then all the thinking that came back against that said, no, that's just not a good recommendation. You can't do it like that. Why can't you do it like that? Well, there's a reason. That's not systems thinking. That's reductionist thinking. How can I make this as simple as possible so that my marketing literature can be very basic and a whole bunch of schools will buy my wireless land solution? But systems thinking says, when someone says, how many APs am I going to need for my school? Systems thinking starts with, it depends. And there are a few out there in the Wi-Fi engineering space that will like that answer and some that won't. But systems thinking starts with, it depends. Let me ask you some questions about the environment. Let me take a look at the environment. Let me understand where the wireless LAN system is going to exist, the greater system it's going to be in then I can answer your question about how many APs you're going to need. So yes, my friends, we've been using system thinking. We just didn't realize it. And when you realize it, it makes it worth your time to go back and study some of these pioneers like Russell Acuff and listen to their thinking and their ideas about systems thinking. And by the way, there are a lot of really great videos on YouTube by Russell Acuff, even though he's no longer with us, where you can get insights into the brilliant thinking that he had after years of cogitating on these issues. And I think it'll impact your thinking. And what it'll do is in the end, it'll make you a better wireless engineer. Thanks for joining me for the podcast today.